So um, I thought I would start by telling you all a little bit about how I got into this research. It's probably one of the questions I often get is, you know, how you know, do the scientists start doing this? So back when I was in graduate school, a friend and I decided that we're gonna run the Boston Marathon. So we started training and we overtrained and I destroyed my knee and my, uh, my back. So I went to see a physical therapist and they told me, stop running and just stretch. And I was not a real big fan of aerobics and whatnot at that point or stretching. And you know, I always did a lot of stretching when I ran. Um, and as I was leaving the physical therapist office, I saw an ad for a vigorous yoga class that promised to promote flexibility and you know, fl uh, stre uh, stretching, but also strength and endurance. And so I thought, wow, this is a great way to stay in shape. Excuse me, I have a little bit of cold. Um, this is a great way to stay in shape and maybe I could start on a marathon. Now at that point, I equated yoga with power pyramids and tinfoil hats and you know, uh, you're not good things. You know, I, thought, I didn't think very highly of it. I went to the yoga class purely as a form of physical therapy. And so I got there and you, the yoga teacher would be like, okay, well this pose will do this for you and this pose will do that for you, making all sorts of health claims. And my eyes were rolling. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm here to stretch. But I had been a runner at that point for about 10 years, and I always stretched before and after I ran. And the amazing thing was after about um, a couple of weeks, you know, after three or four weeks, I really started noticing a change. I was calmer. I was less reactive. People who used to piss me off were not pissing me off. And it was just like, it was really clear to me that it was a yoga practice. And like I said, I had always been stretching, so it was clear that there's more to yoga than just stretching. So um, after I finished my PhD, I decided to switch, and I've still been doing this research ever since. Um, and tonight, um, I'm supposed to talk about meditation, but I'm actually gonna show you a little bit of yoga uh, data as well. And then the next speaker's gonna tell you a lot about yoga. Um, and one of the questions I always get is, um, you know, is yoga med a lot of people feel like yoga and meditation are the same. Some people feel they're different. Um, Chris is gonna talk a little bit about that, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about it. And the question is, yes, there's similarities, there's differences. Um, but we'll talk more about that, I guess, at the end. Anyways, okay, so we're gonna dive into the data now. Okay, all right. So tonight, I'm gonna to talk specifically about mindfulness meditation, right? You've been hearing a lot about mindfulness. What is mindfulness? It's paying attention to the present moment on purpose without judgment. And so there's no mantra. The primary focus is the breath or body sensations and sensory stimuli. So you could do it very easily right here, right now. Just check in. What do your feet feel like? Right, and then contact with the floor. Can you actually, you know, what is your, how do you know your foot's in contact with the floor? Or the back of your body against the chair? And just noticing. And the key thing is having, um, uh, so you're not, your conscious awareness of the present moment. So you're not lost in thought, you're not spaced out, and you're not in a trance state. Right, so you're just very aware. And the key thing is being non-judgmental. So a lot of people, it's, um, the non-judgmental is not that you don't have discernment, but that you're not being judgy. So some of you may think that this room is too hot. Some of you may think it's too cold. The way to just be aware of that without judgment would be like, okay, this is the temperature. It's maybe a bit cooler than I'm used to or would prefer, but not being judgy about it. Not be like, oh, this room is so cold. Why did they return the heat, right? So can you evaluate without making a big judgment about it? Um, so that's a key thing. And so um, uh, I always like this cartoon as sort of a nice way to sort of uh, different way of explaining it. So you can see there's the guy walking outside and he's thinking about you know, all sorts of things versus the dog is just aware of the trees, the sun, the experience of walking down the street. And so the, uh, um, you know, this is what we're aiming for. So as you're walking down the street, can you just be aware of what you're experiencing right then and there, as opposed to thinking about what you just came from or what you're about to go do. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cognitive benefits of meditation tonight. That's gonna to be my main focus. And so the, in this definition, the first part is paying attention to the present moment. Um, you can really think of meditation as being a form of attention training. Um, and so, because what happens is that, you know, you're supposed to be there paying, a presence, the presence, the part, the, paying attention to the present moment. And of course, that gets a little boring and so your mind starts to wander. So you have to go, oh, wait, hold on. Come back to the present moment. And then 30 seconds, a minute later, your mind starts to wander again. And, oh, wait, hold on. Come back to the present moment again. So you really learn to train your attention to, and to sustain your attention. There's also a component of meta-awareness. What that is, is the 
paying attention to what your mind is doing. So you're not just lost in your mind, right? But you're actually sort of stepping back and seeing what's happening in your mind, almost like watching a movie, right, inside your mind. So instead of being there totally absorbed, can you just see that, oh, stuff's going by in my mind? And that's really useful because then you start to notice when the mind starts to wander, right? Because then instead of going off with it to wherever your mind's going, you can sort of see, aha, my mind is starting to wander. Okay, time to come back. Um, and you also have to hold in mind the intention to stay focused while monitoring the presence of random thoughts. Um, and then again, you have to maintain this attitude of non-judging and compassion. Um, and so some of the commonly reported benefits of meditation is a sense of calm and well-being that extends beyond the time you're actually practicing. If you want, you cows can come in and sit down. It's never any fun to stand in the back. So come on in. There's lots of seats in the second, third row. Um, there's decreased levels of stress biomarkers um, and increased health. Uh, like I mentioned, increased mood and capacity to handle difficult situations and emotions. Better memory and attention. I'm going to show you some of that data in a minute. Um, and it also, it's been used to treat a variety of conditions at this point. This is only just a partial list, but I always like this list because this is some, uh, well, the first four are really interesting. So stress, pain, depression, and anxiety are probably the four most common psychiatric or um, psychological issues that people can go to the doctor complain about. And regardless of what other condition you might have, these four are often comorbid. So even if you have something, other disease, you probably, there's a high likelihood that you're going to have stress, depression, pain, or anxiety. Um, and so it's really useful that, um, so, and those often make diseases worse. So the fact that mindfulness is useful to treat these conditions is really useful because then it helps decrease that component, like the psychological component of whatever other disease you might have. But it's also been shown to be effective for many other disorders, including hot flashes, eating disorders, hypertension, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, it also there's been several studies showing that it actually improves people's uh, cognitive abilities. So, they, uh, so the selective attention, which is if uh, it's sort of like the cocktail effect a little bit, like if you're uh, there's a lot going on and you're able to you know pull out and pay attention to the thing and not get distracted by all the things going around you. Cognitive efficiency, so your ability to uh, handle information very quickly and efficiently. Uh, Stroop task, which is, um, again, sort of a ability to ignore just distractors. Ravens is a standard IQ test. I'm going to talk a lot more about that at the end of the talk. Um, uh, decision making, cognitive flexibility, and even creativity. Then this was a study that was done. This is a really nice study. It was a pre-post study. This was done out at University of Chicago. And they randomized students to one of two classes, and they gave them part of the GRE, right? So which is like a standardized test or like the SAT, uh, for those of you who don't know what it is. It's like what you take at the end of, of uh, college in order to get into graduate school. So it's just like the SAT, but a little bit more advanced. And so they gave them this, and they, so they randomized people to either be in a mindfulness class or a nutrition class, and they gave them the GRE. Um, and what they found is that being in the mindfulness class actually improved performance on the GRE. The other thing is they also gave a mind-wandering task. What that was is they had them read some really boring text on a computer. And as you know, when you read really boring stuff, it, your mind starts to wander. And periodically, a little pop-up window would come and say, were you paying attention or was your mind wandering? <laughs> and what we can see is that um, from this is the nutrition class is the mindfulness class. So this is the one where the pop-up window came. And what we see is that there was a decrease in the mindfulness group. So they were better able to stay focused on this really boring text compared to before the two weeks. Um, also, they're told if at any point while you're reading this boring text, you happen to notice that your mind has wandered, uh, go ahead and report that. And again, it's showing a decrease in this. So it's really showing us that they're, you know, even with really boring things, that they're better able to stay focused. So this suggests neuroplasticity to me, right? So what is neuroplasticity? This word just means that it's the ability of your brain to change, right, and to grow and adapt. And so what you can think of is that Behavior is dependent on brain activity, and brain activity is dependent on brain structure. And by brain structure, I just mean something about how the neurons are wired. And what we can see is that this is a bi-directional arrows. Because we know is that anytime you have a new behavior, that influences brain activity, and then that then changes brain structure. So for instance, right now, you're listening and learning, right? And so your brain neurons are firing, and you're understanding what I'm saying. And then, uh, with any luck, uh, It'll change your brain structure, and it'll encode what you're learning. 
So then tomorrow when someone says, hey, what did you learn last night at that talk? This brain structure, because your neurons are now in this new configuration, they'll fire, they'll produce a burst of brain activity that was similar to what you're happening right now and recreate what you're hearing right now. And then that will lead to, oh yeah, so this is what I learned last night. Um, and so I was thinking about this when I'm thinking about the meditation and the yoga practice because I knew that there was this behavior, meditation, where you're sit and you be calm, right? And that it then leads to being calm even when you're not meditating, right? And to have better emotion regulation even when you're not meditating. So could we show that meditation has, is affiliated with specific types of brain activity and that this then leads to changes in brain structure and that these changes in brain structure then lead to changes in brain activity and behavior. So that was sort of my starting point, you know, the hypothesis, like could we actually show that meditation could change the brain? Um, and so it does. <laughs> This is our first study. What we did was we uh, recruited about uh, 20 people from the Boston area who um, practice meditation regularly. And we looked at their brains and we compared them to people who were demographically matched for gender, age, education, and race. And in these areas where there's big yellow spots, there's more gray matter in these people compared to the controls. So the brain has white matter and gray matter. White matter is just wiring, whereas gray matter is where the neurons are actually doing all the work and actually doing the thinking. And other people have shown that more gray matter is core, in specific areas is correlated with more activity or better performance related to those brain areas. Um, so this area of the brain is involved in integrating thoughts, senses, and emotions, which makes a lot of sense because uh, you know, that's what you do when you're meditating, right? Because you have your thoughts and your emotions and you're paying attention to all of them and you're sort of seeing how they all interrelate. Um, it's also involved in awareness and control of visceral processes, such as heart rate and breathing rate. So again, that makes a lot of sense because you're sitting there watching your breath. Um, you know, that's going to make sense that that's an area that should get stronger. It's also involved in recognizing facial emotions, and it's smaller in people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. We also found this part of the brain here in the front of the brain. This is an area involved in working memory and fluid intelligence. So fluid intelligence is the fancy name for IQ. And if you recall, I told you at the beginning that there's been several studies showing that long-term meditators have higher IQ than uh, non-meditators. So it makes a lot of sense. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. When I showed this data, though, I got a lot of pushback from people. Meditators are different, right? Their brains were like that before they even started. It couldn't possibly be the meditation, right? It's because they take 40 minutes out of their day to rest. You know, a lot of them are vegetarians, so maybe it has something to do with their diet. It couldn't possibly be the meditation. Um, and so those are all legitimate criticisms. So uh, to address those, we did another study where we said, okay, can we actually show, we can show changes in gray matter. So what we did was we recruited people who are about to go through an eight week meditation stress reduction program um, out at the University of Worcester. And we took MRI images of them before and after this eight week program and we compared them to a weightless control group. So these are people who had signed up for the class but were willing to wait a couple months to take it. So we just scanned them eight months apart um, during the same t time points as we scanned the people going through the class. And then after we scanned them the second time, they went and they took the class. And lo and behold, we found that indeed, there were several brain regions where we saw changes in the gray matter after just eight weeks. So this region here, this is the PCC. This is the main area of the brain that's involved in mind wandering. And this is the area that gets destroyed in Alzheimer's disease, right? And so as this area gets destroyed in Alzheimer's, people have more and more mind wandering. And so we're finding it increased, so it suggests that more gray matter here is associated with less mind wandering. This area here, which is right by your ear, this is the area that's involved in empathy and compassion. It's about being able to see things from other points of view. Um, this area here um, is in the cerebellum, which is an area that's involved in motor integration, and it smerges down into the brainstem. And when we um, uh, plotted that against um, some of our self-report data, what we found is that the change in the brainstem correlated with well-being. And this is the part of the brainstem where neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine are made and regulated. And so we think, we don't know, this is with lots of hand waving, we think that the changes in gray matter here may be changing how those neurotransmitters are regulated. And this is why they have this increase, because in, the change in this region correlates with change in well-being. And these are questions like, um, I feel like I'm in control of, uh, of um, what I do, I'm satisfied with my work, I'm satisfied with my, uh, with my health. 
The other thing we found was an increase in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the main learning part of the brain. Um, and so, and it's a, a um, people with <coughs> trauma have, and depression have smaller hippocampi than uh, controls. And uh, it's also involved in motion regulation. We also found a decrease in the amygdala. And this correlated with a change in stress. So the amygdala is the main uh, anxiety part of the brain. So you can actually, if you go in and stick electrodes into animals into this part of the amygdala and stimulate it, the animals will freeze and um, they act like they're all freaked out. And so we found the decrease here, and so that's, uh, that's consistent with this being um, decreased arousal and um, you know, less stress. Um, actually, I'm gonna skip through that. Well, okay, they're here. All right, so what we, this is not our work. This is someone else's work. Um, so uh, they took, uh, it was actually rats, but I couldn't find a good rat picture. And sorry if you like Mickey. Um, so what they did is they took rats and they put them in their normal cages. And um, uh, normally if you put a rat into a maze, the rat will go and explore the maze. That's a normal behavior. Um, and so they measured their amygdala and their amygdala was normal, right? So then they stressed them out. For 10 days, they put them in a little cage where they couldn't move for just a couple hours a day, but that really stressed them out. They did not like that. Um, and it's just for a couple hours a day for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they again measured their amygdala, and the amygdala got bigger. So we found the amygdala got smaller, they found it got bigger. And what was interesting is then they put them back in their original cage and let them run them around and move. Um, and three weeks later, their amygdala was still large. And what's interesting also is that when you put them in the maze, they didn't explore the maze. They just sat in the middle of the maze and just cowered, which is a, an anxiety behavior. Um, so it really suggests that, um, and this is what we see, this is the exact opposite of what we're seeing with the humans. Because the humans, there's nothing about their environment was changing, right? So all of them still had their crazy boss, still had you know, the, you know, the relatives that drove them nuts, uh, you know, their commute, everything, like nothing had changed except for their amygdala. And so in both cases, what we're seeing is that the amygdala is responding not to the actual environment, but to your response to the environment. So we thought that was really nice. So it's sort of a, sort of a validation of our findings in an animal model. Um, okay, so the last few minutes, how am I doing on time? Okay, um, um, I'm just gonna show you some data and I have to go through kind of fast. So we'll just highlights here. So this part of the brain, oops, go back. I told you this part of the brain here is involved in fluid intelligence, which is um, IQ. Well, when we plotted the data, what we saw was this. So red is controls and blue are the meditators. And what you see here, and this, this is this part of the brain here, the 25-year-olds and the older meditators have nice thick cortex versus the older people have, it's, it's decaying with age. And this is really well established. It turns out that you know, many, many studies have shown that the whole front half of our brain shrinks as we get older. And this is why as we get older, it takes us a little longer to figure things out and we're just not quite as sharp as we used to be. But it looks like, at least in this few areas, that there's a preservation of cortical structure with aging. And as I mentioned, this is the area of the brain that's involved in IQ. So the first study, we didn't measure IQ. So we replicated the study, and the second time we gave them the standard IQ test. And um, uh, I'm not gonna go through this. And oh, so it's also known, this is uh, uh, intelligence. It's also known that uh, this type, of, so there's two types of intelligence. One type of intelligence, I'm talking fast, sorry. One type of intelligence is just facts and figures, like what you know. Fluid intelligence, which is the IQ, is taking that information and using it to solve novel problems, or being able to take completely new information and use it in new ways. That's what fluid intelligence is. And although the facts and figures increases with age, fluid intelligence declines with age. Again, this is our, you know, we're not quite as sharp as we used to be when we were younger. Um, and so what we did in this study is we just recruited uh, yoga practitioners, meditation practitioners, and controls. And again, they're all matched for gender, age, education, and race. And what we found is the solid line is the controls, and as expected, their IQ decreased with age, but the yoga and meditation practitioners, the IQ was preserved with age. And so this is consistent, and, uh, um, oops, okay. Uh, and it was, uh, we also measured a couple different brain measures, and it was correlated with these changes in uh, preservation of other brain measures. So it really does suggest that meditation might have a bit of an anti-aging effect um, and may help preserve our brain from the normal effects of aging. And so uh, my take home message is just that meditation can literally change your brain. And with that, uh, thank you.